Hi, everybody. Good evening and welcome to the Keys History and Discovery Center's virtual program, Community Views. I'm Jill Miranda Baker, Executive Director. While we continue to miss seeing everybody, we are so appreciative of your engagement with us through this virtual platform. We have reopened the museum, but due to staffing limitations, it is open Wednesday through Fridays only from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. If you're here in the area, we hope you can come for a visit. We continue offering virtual programs and you can find the full slate of our program offerings and registration links at keysdiscovery.com virtual programs. Typically our programs are offered to our members for free as a benefit of their membership and non-members pay a fee to participate. During the pandemic, we have offered our lectures and other new evening programs like this to all free of charge. If you are not a member and are in a position to do, to do so, please consider making a donation through our website, www.keysdiscovery.com backslash support. Every donation, small, medium, and large is greatly appreciated and supports the continuation of these of the lectures and in all of our virtual programming that is helping us share our mission both here and in our community and across the virtual world. Or better yet, become a Keys History and Discovery Center member, which will allow you to continue free participation in the future for our virtual programs and in person. Annual memberships start at just $65 and you can join today at www.keysdiscovery.com backslash members. So tonight I am pleased to introduce our curator, Brad Bertelli. He joined the Keys History and Discovery Center upon its inception in 2013. Brad, we've been working together for a very long time now. He earned a master's degree of fine arts and creative writing from the University of Miami in 2001. Upon moving to the Keys, he quickly embraced the unique and expansive history of the Upper Keys. He is a published author of four books about the Keys, plus two on the Netflix TV series, Bloodline. Brad, the floor is yours. All right, so thank you all for joining. Um, we're gonna talk about the early Florida uh, Key Largo community of Planter, which in, uh, really was the precursor to the uh, current community of Tavernier. And Planter, the area we're talking about is southern, the southern tip of Key Largo. And this is a postcard from 1960 of Harry Harris Park, which is, um, there, you, you see a blue arrow on the uh, left of the screen there, and that points to kind of the, a more uh, direct location of where we're going to talk about a lot of, of, of where Planter was. That was um, kind of the area where the Johnson family um, homesteaded their, their property, also the, the area of, of the, uh, the post office. Um, Planter was really um, all of the community south of south of, um, of, you know, in this area. Um, so it, it, it was more than just this one little area. Here's another slide that kind of shows an overview. This is a thing from the Coast Guard from 1958. And you see um, the US, US-1 at the top there, and that's the band about mile marker 94. Um, HHP stands for Harry Harris Park, which is still a, 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 a very a popular place to go. Um, and then where it says Burton Yacht, Burton Yacht Harbor, that is, where kind of where Ocean Point Suites uh, is today, um, which is, uh, and that was kind of the, the, the center of a lot of the, um, the planter community. And uh, so kind of with that, and if you're looking for a, a marker, um, that's kind of where Dairy Queen, from US-1, kind of where Dairy Queen is today on US-1, where you would turn then down Burton Drive towards, towards this area, which, is, which was historically known as Planter and then became Tavernier at, um, after, after about 19, 1911. All right, so let's start with, uh, this is um, start with some of the old pictures. These are really cool. These are some uh, survey maps drawn by William Crome um, that shows kind of, uh, and we're gonna go into these slides more carefully. On the slide to the right, that was kind of the area that we were just looking at with the arrow on the bottom right pointing to the Johnson. Uh, there you see a, a little, uh, some little squares. Um, that was where uh, Chrome plotted or showed where the Johnson family was, their collection of houses. It's also where the post office was. 
Um, and then on, on the left-hand side, we see the uh, the other kind of end of the island, which, which was still considered planter. You see on the far left, Tavernier Creek, and then using that as a benchmark and moving to the right, that first that first long blue arrow points to where the uh, the Sawyer family was. And then the arrow on the right, that's where the Alberry family was, uh, kind of their collection of houses were. And in between those two things are some interesting locations. Um, kind of there's a large, a long, a long point, a long uh, dip there. Uh, that was kind of called Lowe's Point, if you're between the two arrows. And then there's the school and the church uh, were there. And we'll go into these in, in, in closer pictures. So it, it'll be much more detailed as we get through the presentation. And as I talk about this, we're going to kind of break this down into like three different uh, time periods of planter. This first one is going to be like from 1880 to 1910, and then the 1915 to 1920, like 1930, basically, and then we'll end up with a, a, a more a, a more modern 19 kind of 1936, kind of the last hurrah of planter. Um, and so let's let's uh, let's kind of move on and get into the specifics of this really cool community. And um, here's a a close-up look of, of kind of the, the planter compound. Um, and you can see that Dub Creek is kind of, if, if you want to look for a, a modern a modern uh, landmark, that's kind of the area where Snapper's Restaurant would be today. Again, about mile marker 90, 94. And that's, this is again where the post office is. And this is this old you know, kind of map drawn by, drawn by uh, Chrome is really kind of cool because it shows um, and it's hard to tell, you know, without really blowing it up and going into, I could spend a half an hour on, on each one of these because it shows where some of the old orange groves were and some where heavy timber was, where some of these old lime groves are. And um, we're going to get back to this a little later on with one of the uh, more interesting stories about a post office robbery that happened on Christmas Day. We'll come back to this particular slide at that point. But in the meantime, um, now, the family that's most often you know talked about with this planter area and kind of um, where the post office was was the johnson family and i know we have several members of the johnson family who uh are tuning in with us today and uh, we're thrilled to have have you, have you guys join us we've been e emailing back and forth a little bit over the last week or two and so we uh, are going to have a little bit extra on some johnson family history that i kind of came upon they were, were asking me questions and and I came upon some really cool, some really cool uh, pieces of information that, that, that I'll pass along to you. So this is um, so Samuel Johnson, uh, born in 1838 in uh, Great Harbor, uh, Abaco, in the Bahamas, and moved to Key West when he was about 18 years old. And while he was there, he uh, met Caroline Tedder, and they married on June 26, 1861. And then shortly thereafter, they uh, moved well. About sometime between the 1870s and the 1880s, there's no clear documentation when they moved up to the Key Largo area. Uh, but um, between the 1870 census and the 1880 census, they uh, went from being in Key West to being up in Planter, um, closer to the 1870 side than the 1880 side. Because by 1880, 1881, Planter had really become an, an established area. But this is a really cool old photo of, 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 the, of the patriarchs of the Samuel, of the, um, the Johnson family who settled and, and really began to, to homestead this particular area. And they had eight children. Uh, John Wesley, was, who was the oldest, born in 1864. We're going to work our way down. He married Mary Elizabeth, Samuel Simon, Thomas J., Charles, Edward Payson, who we're going to talk a, a kind of a great, you know, a pretty, pretty good deal about, um, and then Caroline and Raymond. Now, Planter got its name because it was a planting community. What a lot of people don't realize is that in this early time of 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 the Florida Keys in the 1860s, 18 uh, into the turn of the century, and even to like the early 1900s, these were really farming communities. And one of the primary crops were pineapple farming. And this sketch on the left-hand side is actually a sketch 
uh, from the 1880s from uh, Elliot Key, but it really kind of shows uh, what, it, what it was like to work in the pineapple fields with the mosquitoes, um, uh, you know, swarming around, and then people out in the fields cutting down the pineapples and then having to carry them in these burlap sacks from the fields to, to the coast where they could be shipped to, for, for market. And the picture on the right is kind of interesting. Um, this is a more, this was after the turn of the century and they're farming tomatoes or collecting tomatoes. And what's kind of interesting about that picture is when you think of farming today, you think of rows and rows and rows of these, of, of the crops, you know, of, in, in this case, you know, tomato, 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 tomato. But in those days, there and, and now, there was not a whole lot of, of, of fertile soil that, that, that you could, it was very rocky and you really couldn't just plant rows of, 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 um, of crops. But what you would do is you would take a stick and you would kind of walk through and kind of poke looking for depressions in between all the rocky areas. And when you found a, a depression, you could plant a seed there and then kind of move on. And that was how you know, the crops were kind of, kind of done um, in, in those days. Now, this is, a, uh, this is a, um, a photograph of how Planter looked. And this is the, the Johnson family area. This is around 1903. So this is kind of towards the end of, of the Planter community. Um, but we see a lot of the Johnson family houses. And we see also the long piers that extend out into the water. Again, this was, there was no train at this point. So all, all, everything that came in and out of the community had to be done so by boat. And as you know, many of you know, who are, are used to um, you know, being in the water around the Florida Keys, that it's very shallow, very rocky. There's not a lot of, not a lot of um, deep harbors to go through. So a lot of these families, a lot of these houses had these long extended docks that went out to more navigable waters. So these, these, uh, these uh, shallow draft ships could come closer to shore. Now this is just kind of a close up of that, of, of that last image showing more of the, more of the, the houses. Um, and we're gonna talk about some of these houses individually as we go on, but I just wanted to give you kind of an overview. And, and you can see how rocky the shore is there. You know, these were, you know, started out as, you know, 100,000 years ago. This was you know, a flourishing, you know, tr a coral reef that uh, rose up and then land settled on, on top of it or grew up out of it. Not a lot of, uh, not a lot of topsoil to, you know, to be cultivating this, this farmlands, which is kind of surprising because this was farming was one of the primary uh, modes of, 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 of you know sustaining yourself and you know and, and income for your family. And this is another uh, another shot of the Johnson compound. That arrow points down to the post office, and uh, the post office was the only post office between Key West and Coconut Grove. And the postmaster lived in that fancy. Uh, there's a, a two-story house next door um, who uh, was where John Wesley Johnson, the oldest uh, child of, the, uh, of, of Simon and, and Caroline uh, Johnson, the patriarchs of, of the Johnson family. Now, this is another one of the brothers. This house in, in, in the forefront is Simon Johnson. Um, and if you look to the left of the Johnson, of Simon's house, you'll see the gutter system because fresh water, always a challenge. So all of these houses had gutter systems that would empty out into a cistern. There's a small, there's a concrete cistern behind the house there. And you can see the gutters kind of, the gutter system all around the house. And then moving away from, from the Simon Johnson house, um, moving further on into the picture, we have the church uh, parsonage, which is the next, the next, uh, house and structure over. And the parsonage is where the, uh, the uh, Methodist preacher was, uh, would stay. And um, one of the earliest, uh, earliest churches in, in the Keys, especially in the Upper Keys, was in this community of, of, of Planter. And then um, next door uh, to uh, the parsonage or, or just the next house down would be John Wesley Johnson's house. Who again was the oldest member of the oldest child of the family? Now this is a um, kind of a a dead-on shot of John Wesley's uh, home, and again you can see these long the, the two arrows are pointing to in, in, 
in, in the case of the arrow on the left, this long extended uh, gutter system that would empty out into uh, the cistern. And the arrow that's next to uh, John Wesley's house, that's another, it, it's very dim in the picture, but that's, that's another uh, gutter coming off of the house and emptying into, emptying into the, uh, um, into the, uh, the cistern. Now the house to the left there, that is again, that, that's the parsonage where the Methodist preacher would have, have lived during his time in the community. Now we're going to go from here into the planter post office. And this is where it's gonna get a little interesting um, from the history aspect. And this is why history can be uh, infuriating and, and interesting because it says, you know, the records I could find were, says that the that the uh, post office was established December 23rd, 1891, but that's going to come into question in sh just shortly. Um, but John Wesley Johnson was the, the again the eldest son. He was the postmaster, and because of the shallow nature of the uh, of the water in, in front of Planter, the side wheel uh, steamer Key West, which would deliver, it, it would run between Key West and Coconut Grove, bringing mail. Um, with, was too big to come into the, the harbor here at Planter. So what John Wesley did was he rode his skiff out there and in deeper water, he uh, put a post in the water and on this post put two, two, uh, two hangers on there and then he would hang the mailbag out there every day. And the, the Key West would come up and this was in deep enough water for it, for it to access. It would take, if it was going, uh, you know, going north, that it would stop and take the bag and, and go to Coconut Grove. And then if it was going south or coming back from Coconut Grove, it, it would stop and take the mail to Key West. And John Wesley would do this every day. He would, he, he would, uh, he would uh, paddle his skip out every day to exchange the mail bags. Now, where it kind of gets interesting, especially for me as someone who tries to make sense of history and tries to really get a good handle on it, was, um, and I've touched on this story before in, in the book Key Largo, it, the uh, post office was robbed of $107 on Christmas day. And the only account I knew of this was a, a newspaper account that was here that was came out in, on February 6, 1901 from published in the Florida Times Union, which is in Jacksonville. And it stated, uh, some time ago, the post office at Planter on Key Largo was broken up and two colored men were arrested and brought to this city by Deputy Marshal McCormick. Yesterday morning, they were sentenced in the United States court to two years each in the penitentiary at Nashville, Tennessee. The names of the prisoners are William Farmer and Robert Durham. Durham. Now, previously, before, uh, before last week, this is the only version of the story I, I'd, I'd ever come across. But as I was preparing for this, this, um, th this uh, presentation, um, I, was, I, I found an, another firsthand account of what went on during that robbery and when, or the circumstances that, that led up to that robbery. And part of the, um, the frustration and the interest of, of the history was the firsthand account does disputes the opening of the post office amongst other details, and, and we'll get into those. So as I was researching for this, this presentation, I found this um, book called Where, When, and How to Catch Fish on the East Coast of Florida, which was published in, eight, in 1902. William H. Gregg and John Gardner uh, were the names on, on, the, uh, on the book. Um, John Gardner was actually the captain of the ship who was involved in this, and William H. Gregg was kind of the leader of the, uh, of, of the, there were four people on board this boat. And they um, would end up visiting Planter on Christmas day, but in 1890. Um, and they would also were able to provide alibis for the two men who were arrested, but their, uh, their story was ignored, which is interesting. And I'll get more into that in just a second. So what I was, what I was able to, uh, to come up with after reading there, what happened on that day on Christmas day in 1890 was, um, and that brings us back to uh, this, this uh, survey map done by Chrome. And if you, 
So Gardner and, and, and Greg are on this boat and they come down the bay side and they, uh, you'll see Hammer Point on the top of the top of, of the sketch. They would come to, uh, there's, you'll see the blue, the, blue, uh, the blue arrow there is pointing to a wharf. And there was a wharf here and what is, these two guys were at and they were manning a farm that was there. And they uh, and and Greg and uh, and Gardner came came ashore to get water uh, for their rest of their journey, but also because they wanted to check, or especially Greg wanted to, to check his mail at the planner's post office. And he, according to his accounts, had been there several times. And again, this is 1890. He had been there several times, and whenever he was in the area, he would stop to check for mail at the post office because he would often get mail there. And again, this is a full year prior to when the only documents I can find about the opening of the post office, I'm gonna have to look into that more, more quickly or more, more thoroughly. Um, but you'll see um, with the rest of the blue arrows there, there is a little line and, and Greg and, 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 uh, and Gardner and also uh, two other guys, the crew members from the boat took a walk from the bay side of Key Largo they walked through uh, citrus fields and and and, um, and, uh, uh, and and pineapple fields and and um, and cucumbers and onions and tomatoes. They were walking from one side of the island to the other side, which they said was about two and a half miles long. Um, and they ended up coming uh, to Planter, um, to the Johnson area, where they said there was about twenty or you know twenty or thirty people living in, in that particular area of planter at the time um, and they went to, you know, to go to the post office to, to check, check the mail but it being Christmas day there was nobody in the area they had all gone to church or to some someplace else and to celebrate the holiday so the area was deserted but they hang they hung out for <coughs> excuse me for a, an hour or two <clears throat> hoping someone would, would show up and no one did. So they um, turned back around and walked back, walked back to the other side of the island and spent the rest of the day in the company of the two gentlemen who were, uh, who were working the farm on the other, other side of the island. Now the next day, Greg and, and, um, and, and, and Gardner walked back to the planter post office to check mail and there was a young man of about 18 who was at the post office and who recognized Gardner or, or Greg, who, because he had been there, he recognized him as coming, you know, um, had previously coming there. And, and this, the boy had known that someone had been at, at, the, at the post office because one of their friends about 11 o'clock had been sailing past and viewed Gardner and, and his group, Greg and Gardner and his group, kind of hanging out on, on the, on the wharf on the dock waiting for someone to show up so they knew that someone had been there and after they you know, were talking about that they said yeah we, we were here you know we, we hung out for a while no one showed up so we walked back and we, we came back today and this is when um the young man at uh, was a member of the johnson family explained that the that the uh, uh post office had been robbed of, of 107 dollars and Greg and Gardner were like, well, we were with the two guys. And he accused the two guys from, from, the, from the other side as being the ones who had, who had, robbed, who had robbed, the, robbed the post office. And um, Gardner and Greg both had said, you know, well, we were with those guys the entire day. And they, they you know, weren't over here. They are with us the, uh, the entire day. But the, uh, the, the Johnson boys said, well, you know, we, they've confessed. We've, we've gotten the money and, and they're, you know, in custody. But it was interesting because in 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 Greg and and, um, and and Gardner's account was like, yeah, we told them that you know, but they didn't listen to anything we had to say, and they just went ahead and and, uh, and took the other two guys um, to Jacksonville, and where they were sentenced to uh, to prison. Now, going back to the rest of the of the planter area, kind of more more between um, between the post office, the Johnson family. And then working towards um, Tavernier Creek, we have the first arrow going from right to left. The first arrow arrow shows where the Alonzo Alberry um, 
constant, ha, ha, the Albury houses, the Albury families had congregated. And, um, and so the next arrow down from that would be the church building and then the school building. And then that little dip in, in the land, which is known as Lowe's Point, Lowe's Point today. And it's interesting that there's no Lowe family that are, that are sitting there, be, no, no houses that are, are documented on that area because that's kind of where, where the Lowe family had, uh, had congregated. And then you see also the, that, that long, dark, heavy line uh, going through the middle of the island. That is Chrome, um, as uh, in his survey, uh, you know, uh, pu putting where the where the railroad right right right, right of way w would end up uh, being being. Now, this is another another one of the Johnson family uh, houses. Now, this is um Tom Johnson's house, and this is interesting because it's in 1906. There, um, you know. They've been growing, you know, uh, uh, tomatoes, cucumbers, pineapples were a primary crop. Um, cucumbers, melons, uh, uh, onions, um, and also, and one of the things that I was talking about with uh, one of the members of the Johnson family, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, but who said that that also that they were growing sugar cane, a small, you know, small area of sugar cane as well, sugar cane as well, because his father would would break off a piece and chew, chew, chew sugar cane sometimes in the, in, in the fields. But what happened in 1906 with this hurricane, and this was the first of a series of hurricanes that would bring um, kind of bring a, 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 what's referred to as a blight into a pineapple blight on, on to the, into the farmland area. And when I think of blight and hurricanes, what crosses my mind is that um, the blight is not so much a problem with the plants themselves, but a plant, but a problem with the soil, um, because as you know, when a hurricane comes, there is a uh, in, generally there's a storm surge that comes across, and whenever there's a storm surge after the hurricane, all that salty water comes across the land, and everything everything dies, the the grass dies, you know, all, all the plants and the, the mangroves not so much, obviously, um, who are more salt tolerant. But some, but a, a lot of these um, these crops, these uh, the tomatoes and, and, and the pineapples and things, did start did begin to suffer. And this kind of starts the beginning of the end of the planter community. Also, the year a year later, in 1907, um, we, Henry Flagler's train begins to uh, you know begins to operate in, in the Upper Keys. And by 1908, um, there's daily service. From the mainland all the way to Knights Key at the base of the Seven Mile Bridge. So at this point, no longer are boats the only way that resources, that mail, that friends, that coffee and flour and things can be brought into a uh, in, into Planter, or the only way that their their crops can be shipped out of Planter. But now Henry Flagler and his railroad are offering a much more a much more uh, reliable source. Of, of, of movement between of bringing both products in and, and friends and family and also moving products out. Now this is um this is this is a, a really cool old postcard. This is the um, Planter Church, uh, which and the and the postcard is dated November fifteenth, uh, nineteen o seven. And this is everyone dressed up in their in their Sunday finest. Always a dog in the picture. Um, but what's kind of cool, on the, you'll see some writing on the right-hand side there. And what that says is, Dear Ida, could not get number three Douglas shoes. Had number two, but didn't know you, if they would suit. No stove polish, I send the Sapolio. Love to all, Vivian. And Sapolio apparently was a brand of soap that was really known for its advertising. Um, that, I had to look up Sapolio because I knew someone was probably going to ask that. So I wanted to make sure and get that in there. Um, now, this is um, this is some of the uh, some of the uh, uh, of the um, Johnson family. Uh, Newton Pinder is, is the is the guy standing up to the far left. He was a partner of of, of Edward Payson John, Johnson. Pace Johnson. He's the guy with the kind of the uh, cowboy looking hat. And this is his wife and three of his children. We have uh, Jenny May on the uh, just below. Uh, Payson's uh, belt line there, and then his wife, Charity, and then Edward. And then we have a, a picture of Ralph as a young boy. I know um, 
Ralph's, at least one or two of Ralph's kids are, are watching us right now. And one of the cool things that I found or that I came across was, a, was the wedding announcement of Charity and Edward, and Edward Payson Johnson, which I don't have a slide of, but I, I do want to read it to you because it really kind of shows a little more of, of, of what life was like in, in 1907 you know, in, in the Upper Keys. So the article was from the Miami News and is dated August 30th, 1907, Johnson Alberry. Uh, Charity was an Alberry. Uh, um, so the headline was, Very Pretty Wedding Occurred Last Week on Plantation Key. On last Wednesday evening, August 21st, at the residence of the bride's grandmother, Mrs. Elizabeth Pinder on Plantation Key, occurred the marriage of Miss Charity Alberry to Mr. E. Payson Johnson. The ceremony was performed by Reverend E. A. Cray, pastor of Sparks Chapel, Key West, who made the trip for that purpose, and Mrs. Leander Andrews had charge of the arrangements. The parlor was beautifully decorated for the auspicious occasion with American flags, palms, coconut branches, and chrysanthemums forming a very pretty arch the effect being of one being one of tropical luxuriance. The wedding march was played by Mer, Mr. Merlin Alberry. Miss Elise Andrews was maid of honor, and Mr. Robert Thompson was best man. The bride was given away by her father, Mr. Joseph Alberry, after spending the next day at the former house of the bride. The happy couple left for a planter where they will in future reside carrying with them the best wishes of their many friends for a long and happy life. They received many beautiful and useful presents. The bride is one of the East Coast's most lovely girls, extremely popular among all who know her, and the groom is a highly and respected and prosperous young farmer who is to be congratulated on winning such a charming bride. That was kind of a cool glimpse into a, a wedding ceremony that happened, you know, 113 years ago, 113. 15 years ago, 113 years ago, very, very kind of cool. Now, this is another picture, and I just added this just, just, just right before I came in, because it shows Ralph Johnson and two of the, uh, two of, um, one of the sons of, of uh, Payson and Charity, and, um, and two of his children, um, which I thought would just be kind of a, a kick, I know that some of the family members are watching right now. So, and, I'm gonna go back real quick. Um, the young man on the far right, that's Ralph Johnson as a little boy. And this is him as a married man with, a, with two of his children. All right. Now this was kind of a cool, um, I came across a, uh, a, 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 a newspaper account from the Miami Metropolis dated March 16th, 1900, and just kind of highlighted some of the things that were going on in Planter on, during that time. And Mrs. E. Heyman, teacher, was preparing her children for a concert. John Wesley Johnson was building a rock wharf to be as strong as Gibraltar. Mr. Richard Tedder, a.k.a. Captain Slick, was raising tomatoes. And Tom Johnson's onions weigh, th weigh three quarters of a pound. And those are, that's, I, I looked up, you know, onion sizes, and those were some pretty good sized onions. And, and that, I thought that was really kind of a really cool detail to add. Now, this is a picture of Payson and Charity uh, around 1910. And again, I, I alluded to earlier or talked about the hurricane of 1906. There's also a hurricane 1909 and 1910. And also Flagler's Railroad had, had arrived and most of the, you know, offering a much more stable, a much more reliable source of, 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 of information and, and items coming in and information and items going out. Um, and Payson and Charity are considered uh, some of the last, if not the last, to leave the original um, town site or the original community of Johnson, uh, I'm sorry, of Planter. And they would move um, initially from the coastline closer, as most of the people from the community, away from the coastline and closer to the railroad and, and the convenience that, that it was offering. And now we're gonna talk about Payson and Charity a little bit, uh, if I found some, and again, because the family was, uh, had contacted me and we were talking, and this is uh, grandparents, I believe. Or, and um, 
we're going to sell out. And they were asking, they wanted to know when Payson and Charity moved from, from Tavernier to Key West. And I have some information. I'm going to get to that. So, and this is another thing that was, was kind of cool. This was Edward Payson Johnson's. This is his draft registration card, which he filled out on September 12, 1918. And at this point in 1918, he was still living in Tavernier. And uh, he's age 39 at this point. Um, and uh, what's really kind of cool, I'm not cool, but uh, another interesting detail was that he was blind in his left eye. All right, so also interesting is that his date on here, his birth date is January 11th, 1879. And we have um, records indicate that he was born like 16 years early, earlier than that. And uh, it says age and years 39 in 1917, um, that would be 29. He would be in 1879 from 1818. Quick math, 29. So, it's, so it was interesting math going on there. All right. But after, so my my thought is that that the uh, Johnson, Payson, and Charity moved from Tavernier uh, by in, in, in 1920. So in 1920, they would arrive in Key West. We know that Edward Payson would stop being a farmer. Um, farming had really become a way of, of, of the past uh, for several reasons I won't get into right now. I, I, I'll get into a, a, different, a different point. Um, but Edward Payson in 1920 began working as an assistant lighthouse keeper on Sombrero Key Lighthouse. And so from 1920 to 1922, he was a second assistant keeper from 22 to 36, the first assistant keeper and the head keeper from 1936 to 1941. And as a a keeper at the lighthouse, he would spend long, long amounts of time away from home and out at the reef, out at the lighthouse. And you'll see the bottom structure of the lighthouse there. That is, those are living quarters. Some people were, had, that, that was a manned lighthouse until I believe 40s, 50s, something on top of my head. Um, but because he was away from, from home so much, his wife and family had probably moved to Key West and we're living in Key West by about 1920. What we know for sure, all right, well, son, here's, a, here's an, an older picture of Charity and Payson. Um, and what we know for sure is that uh, it, according to 1923 Key West City Directory, he is definitely, they're definitely already in, in Key West. Um, he is assist, the assistant keeper and they were living at, 615 Francis Street in Key West. So at least from 23 on, um, probably a couple years prior to that, I can't imagine that uh, that Charity and her and her children were living um, in had remained in Tavernier, uh, which would have been you know equally as far from uh, the lighthouse as Key West, where members of their family were already living, uh, extended family. So my guess is that they would have, they arrived probably in ninth, probably by the time that he was working as a as, as a lighthouse keeper at the, the lighthouse that the family had had moved and reloc relocated to Key West. Um, now we're going to segue to kind of the second incarnation of Planter, which really starts to incorporate the Thompson family. And uh, the Thompson family, most notable for the Thompson Cigar Company, which was formed by Robert Thompson in 1915. Um, in 1920, the uh, I believe he sold he sold the cigar company. I think in 1918, the cigar company would relocate to Ybor City uh, in the Tampa Bay area in 1920, and then again in 1934, relocate to Bartow, uh, Florida. But the Thompson Cigar Company is uh, still the oldest mail order cigar company in the in the U.S. But the Thompsons had several several children, and um, here's a picture of 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 uh, some of the children moving left to right. We have Ernst, uh, then Rose, and then Anthony, who was the youngest. And then I believe that older gentleman is the grandfather. Um, I can't. I ha in, in one record I have them have him as being Robert. Another record having him as being as the father. Another another record as having him being the grandfather. 
Um, I think in 1955, um, he's labeled as the grandfather, so I'm gonna go with, with that one. But what's interesting is that um, Ernst is holding a pineapple. And uh, the only two, the only two Thompson brothers who would actually stay, they, they would move to uh, Robert Thompson, would, would end up buying a, uh, a, a farm, farmland in the planter area. In fact, he would buy Charity uh, Payson and Charity's uh, farm, farmlands in, in, in planter, I believe in 1919. But what's interesting is that um, Ernst is holding a pineapple there. And kind of another funny thing, Ernst would not live in, in planter, but when he would visit by train, um, it was said that he would bring a, a suitcase full of his favorite food, which was baked beans, to make sure that he would have that to accompany all the other, the shellfish and, and the turtle and the lobster and the conch and, and the fish that were really a part of, of, of the staple of, of what they were eating. But also, um, they were also eating, uh, you know, possum and raccoon and, and, um, and box turtles and um, rabbits and all, you know, other, other terrestrial animals as well as, as what, what the sea could offer. Now the Thompson, Tom, the Thompson family purchases uh, Payson and Cherry's property in 1919. It was a 40 acre farm they purchased. Uh, Victor and Marvin Thompson would then subdivide. Victor was another one of the, uh, one of the, of the brothers uh, and Marvin was um, another one of the brothers. They would subdivide the uh, former uh, Johnson property into what is became known as, and still known as the Palma Sola subdivision. And Victor would name all the streets after palm trees. And this area is known as Harry Harris Park area today. And when you drive in, drive in that area, um, all the street names are named after Sable and other, other, other palm trees. But, the, but they paid, uh, the Thompsons paid $1,000 for the 40 acre farm. It included a 20 acre citrus grove that, that was fruit bearing, uh, two wooden houses, two concrete cisterns, two boat docks, one Nassau dinghy, and one storage house that uh, the youngest uh, Thompson brother, Anthony or Tony, would uh, call a home for, uh, for all the rattlesnakes and mice that could uh, possibly be accounted for in, in one little area there. But this is a picture of Marvin Thompson who was, had quite a number of, number of jobs. He uh, was, was a real estate developer, obviously, when he, uh, he and his older brother, Victor, um, developed the Palma, the Palma uh, Sola subdivision. He was also a writer. He would act, this is a really cool old book um, by Nicky Beer called uh, Pi Pirate, uh, Pirates, Pineapples and People. And, and um, Marvin Thompson would actually write the foreword for this book. He was not the only writer in the family as we will talk about in a second. But uh, he was also, uh, Tom, Marvin Thompson became um, Tavernier's first justice of the peace, or at least an early justice of the peace. But there was, and this, this was an interesting little note, there was no jail in Tavernier. So when Marvin would have to, have to, you know, uh, to take someone under arrest, there was no place to put them. So he would bring them back to his home and planter and kind of, and, 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 and keep them there until he could go down to, down to QS and put them in, in, in a proper jail. Um, this is Anthony Thompson, Tony Thompson, who was the youngest of, of the brothers. He was a, a really interesting guy. Um, he was kind of a recluse. Uh, he, he talked a lot about one really interesting thing. He, he was another writer. He was a poet. He actually had a couple of poems published in, um, in, in anthologies. But he has this really interesting, he was working on a, on, on, on a book kind of of his feelings or his experiences in, in in the planter area. And what was I, what I found really interesting was that he was born and raised in Key West. And one of the things he talks about living in planter was having always wanted to grow up and live on an island. And that struck me because he did grow up and live on an island in Key West, but uh, probably not quite as, 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 as islandy, as, as deserted as, as, um, as the planter area was. But he was fairly reclusive and built a little shack out on the water that he could see for miles in any direction. And if people would come to talk, and he, he didn't want to talk to them, he would just kind of hide off in the bushes in, in, until, they, until they, they went away. And he was also a water cowboy, which um, I find really interesting um, because, and you'll see why in a second, 
because um, he was kind of a, he was known, he was another character uh, in the area who grew, apparently grew some of the best tomatoes in, in all of Key Largo and all of the area. But this is a really cool advertisement that I believe showed up in Life Magazine. And it was from Hiram Walker, which is a, a liquor producer. And, um, and, and the small kind of script below his name says, uh, Tony Thompson, the 3,000 pound manta ray he captured live for one marine collector. The 18 foot live Mako shark he towed in, in off the dry tortugas. They were all in a day's work for this famous water cowboy. Bat like giant rays, man eating sharks. He gets them all alive for marine museums. I just thought that was, uh, and then the kind of subtext behind, the, beneath the picture in a bottle of, of whiskey it says, for men among men, Hiram Walker makes a whiskey among whiskeys. Uh, that was kind of cool. All right. Now we're kind of going into the uh, kind of the third stage of of um, of planter, which had been largely deserted at this point, um, except for the, Tony Thompson was, was, was still living there. Marvin had a house back in that area, but that was that was pretty much all of it, until uh, Jack Wilkinson uh, decided to show up around 1936. And this is a really e excellent book. Um, it had to be you that we just republished, written by Kay Wilkinson, Jack's wife, and that's the the two of them on the cover there. On the cover there, and we uh, were able to reproduce that. So now it's available on Amazon. It's available here at the, at the museum. Um, it's great uh, stories of uh, historic pictures, which I'll show a few of, and then some great stories about early life in the Tavernier and the, they were uh, living in the planter area, um, and uh, and we'll show you some some of how they were living in the planter area. But it's a, if you want a really kind of interesting, interesting read about early life in, in the 1930s and early 1940s in the Tavernier and Planter area, do yourself a favor and, and get a copy of this. Get some really fascinating, really fun stories in there. But this is um this is their house. Really, Jack Wilkinson first came down from Miami and just kind of, you know, put up a put up a tent and just began to really just 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 live off the land. And um, this is a picture of, of he and his wife, Kay. Um, and that, what that arrow is pointing to is a uh, kind of a cool detail, just a picture of some, of, of some shark jaws up there. And I know it's, it's, uh, we're going to run through the next pretty, best of sides pretty quick, so we have plenty of time for questions. Um, so they were really squatters. And this is kind of a, uh, this is um, a place called Planter Point, which was really kind of the area where the Johnson family had once been. And where that uh, that that wharf that um, that uh, um, John Wesley Johnson, the oldest son of the Johnson family, had had built in 1901, that was going to be you know as secure as as Gibraltar, and they're kind of at the base of that area. This is their living in their tent, and they pretty much lived off of everything they could gather from what was around them, what came, what was in, in the water, and one of their early things that they found what floated up was this love seat that, that they were sitting in they're sitting in here and um, this is kind of a, a typical gathering at the wilkinson's this is about 1939 and there's always lots of liquor around and having a good time um uh, jack would bring would go would, would travel to uh, miami to pick up moonshine and he would flavor the moonshine with apricots and prunes and other things we have different kind of versions of it and they would all sit around and eat and drink and have a good time. My family would, they had a, Kay had, had family in, in, in uh, Miami for a short time and they would have all their friends if they would always come out to uh, the trek to visit them in Planter. And this is just kind of a, a kind of a scene. You can see how, how wide open and how much sand and open space there was with, with the coconut palms. This is just one of the gentlemen out there with target practice shooting, shooting the rifle. Um, this is uh, this is uh, Jack in in a skiff that he uh, that he had found, and he would go conking. He would go travel th through the shallows looking for conch shells. Um, and then, uh, of course, turtles were an important part of uh, of the diet back in those days, both in restaurants and also for everyday living. And this is a couple gentlemen um, who were fixing and mending the turtle nets. The, the turtle nets. All along, this was called the Planter Road, the road to the Planter. And then, uh, you know, a couple bringing in a couple of turtles and cleaning the turtles. 
for they would you know use turtle steaks. They would some of the meat would be ground up for for turtle burgers. They would also walk the beaches at night looking for turtle uh, turtle nests and then dig up the uh, dig up the uh, uh, the um, the eggs you know for, for uh, as another source of protein. And then of course you know were you know turtles, lobster, conch. Um, and this was the uh, this was the Wilkinson kitchen. And one of the things that was kind of interesting for both the Wilkinsons and and the and the uh, the Thompsons was when it came time to do dishes. You know, they would what they would do is they would take the pots and then put them out in the water and weight them down with a rock or something, and then let the fish and crabs and stuff kind of nibble off and pick up all the and do all the heavy work of of, of cleaning cleaning off and then. They would re retrieve the water, the, the you know the the pots and the pan. Uh, the next day makes it much more easier to clean once they've been all the you know all of the uh, uh, residue and all the remnants of, of dinner had been cooked. But again, great on open fire, um, just very very um, you know living off the land. And this is a picture of of, of Jack and 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 their youngest uh, boy Johnny. And I will tell this, there's this one, there's some really great stories in this book, It Had to Be You. But one of the great stories before they had kids was um, Jack had been walking kind of up and out in the water and um, Kay had been back on shore and Jack had taken off his, he, he was walking naked through the water, you know, through a, a naked and about, you know, a, a stomach deep water. And then Kay says all of a sudden he lets out a whale and, he, and he's jumping around and and Kate, Kate didn't know what was going on, but as as Jack was walking through the shallows, you know, with, with no pants on, an octopus reached up and grabbed him by by the balls, basically, and um and and squeezed, and he had was trying to rip that rip that off, and that was the last time I think that he walked around naked in the water. But mostly, what the uh, Wilkinsons and what what the stories in, in the book kind of talk about are just family friends getting around together and, and eating. And enjoying each other's company, and and, and living a much simpler life. Um, this is this would have been in, in the late 1930s, uh, early 1940s. And then we have one more, one more uh, quick story about life in in, in planter in, in those days. Um, and this is one of the cisterns that one of the concrete cisterns that were built during you know the Johnson Johnson time there, and um, and uh, Jack had decided to. Put a top on on the cistern, so that became kind of a, a makeshift hotel for when people would come visit. They would have they, they would put their a couple of cots in inside the inside the cistern, and that's where people that's where they would sleep at night, or visitors visitors could sleep at night because their their tent would only hold three people, you know, Jack and and, and Kate, and then or Kay, and then maybe one other friend, you know, who would come down to visit. But when they had more than a couple of friends. Then they would have, you know, this would be a kind of additional hotel room for them to stay in. But then one night there were a couple of girls uh, who were staying staying in the cistern room, the cistern hotel, and in the middle of the night they they, they were feeling something crawling around. So they lit a, a, a candle or a flashlight and it, it looked around and it was inside was covered with scorpions, which are today even a, a problem sometimes. Uh, they're they're definitely around still. But I could imagine that would have been kind of a freaky thing to do to wake up out, out of your sleep and then be surrounded by scorpions. Needless to say, they, the, the two girls ran out and I believe spent the rest of the night out on the uh, on the wharf, uh, on one of the docks. So that's going to, we're going to leave with that one and then open it up for questions. So Aaron, do you want to? Yes, I'll take it from here. Um, thank you, Brad, for that wonderful presentation. Um, I am Erin Muir, and I'm going to be facilitating the question and answer portion of, um, of the program this evening. Let's give this a shot. While we're waiting for folks to find the raise hand button, we do have um, a couple of questions that have were typed in during the presentation. So Brad, Kat would like to know, um, she says that she remembers walking with her dad along the shore south of Harry Harris Park in the early 70s, and he pointed out the remnants of foundations that he called the old planter community. She'd like to know, are they still there, and are they protected as historic landmarks? Sadly, they are not. Um, there was an effort made to protect them that did not uh, come to fruition. 
Ocean Point Suites is kind of the, uh, it's is it a condominium plus timeshares, rentals area there. Um, that is kind of where that, where those remnants, where those um, cisterns and, what, and where those, uh, those artifacts would have been. And they have all been destroyed in that area and they were not, they were not preserved. There are a couple of cisterns or remnants of cisterns kind of behind the baseball fields out in the woods uh, north going the other direction. But as for um, where you were walking, um, those were not, not, not saved. Not, not, not for lack of trying, but, the, but they were not saved. All right, thank you so much for the question. Um, we actually have a second question submitted by um, Kat. And she said she keeps seeing these old historical photos of the keys where vast swaths of land look denuded of brush and trees. Is that because the land was cleared by settlers for agriculture? Um, in many cases, probably. Um, th this was large farming. The Johnsons, for, in for instance, they had seven farms, I believe, in that six or seven farms in that area. So they would have had to clear absolutely for, you know, for, uh, for groves, for lime groves and orange groves, and for the, you know, for tomatoes and and cucumbers and onions and melons. So a lot of that land would have been cleared because left to his own device, if you you know, if you leave any kind of lot now, you know, without any, without any kind of maintenance, it's going to become overrun with with plants and trees over a short period of you know over several years. But you know, but definitely probably largely due to largely due to agriculture, early agriculture. Excellent, thank you. We have another question from Susie. Susie would like to know, is Jerry Wilkinson related to the Wilkinson family you mentioned? No, they're not. Same last name, but, but not related at all. All right. Um, Melissa Alberry would like to know, I'm, she says, I'm surprised there's not more mention in your presentation about the Allberries and would like to know more about them. Um, uh, more, <laughs> you know, such, such, such a wide- they, as, it, as it relates to planter. Yeah, well, there was, a, um, um, and this, you know, kind of goes back to Aaron's family. Um, Alonso Allberry is, 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 is and, and, and some of those, uh, um, Alonzo's wrong. Is it? You're, who are you thinking? Try Robert. No, uh, Rodney's uncle. Merlin. Oh no. Um. No, that's the that's a oh, brother. Uh, Absalon. Absalon Albury. That's what, that's what I'm thinking. That was the Albury family that, that was shown in the in the on Chrome sketch, and I know that's where. Uh, 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 Captain Rodney Alberry um, would, you know, and, and Aaron's family members from, from that area. I know there's lots of, I would love to be able to go through every family and in, and this was, I had to cut out, I had like 70 or 80 slides at one point and it's hard to, you know, figure out, you know, trying to tell, you know, as, as broad a story as possible, but there's, it, and, and over time we will, you know, I would love to get to, and we will get to every family at one point. That's kind of, that's what we're doing here. Um, but. And that was, and what was kind of really cool, and um, one of, in 1919, uh, Rodney Alberry um, would go back to the planter area and buy one of, or, or and buy one, of, uh, disassemble uh, one of the houses, one of the, and it thought to be Tom Johnson's house. And he disassembled the house in the, in the planter area and then placed it on his boat and then kind of took it piece by piece back to Tavernier and reassembled it. And um, and that that house is still standing, uh, or portions Portion of it still of standing, it. are are still standing at uh, next to Old Settlers Park, and there is a lot you know there's a, a lot of great history uh, through the um, you know from Merlin Alberry through uh, through uh, the, the early postmasters and there's so much great stories so many great stories there and that's something that we'll definitely dive into on, on another topic. Um, I can spend more time doing that. And, you know, uh, we will definitely get to the Albright family. There's a great, you know, incredibly rich history there. And, you know, Erin is, is directly, you know, she's seventh generation? Sixth. Sixth generation. Seventh. 
Fiddle learners, yeah. Should, I should, should know that by now. So there, so we definitely have um, uh, have the resources, the pictures, and, and the stories to tell. And that's definitely a program that we'll, that we'll put together in the future. Melissa, we're probably related um, <laughs> because my grandmother was an Alberry. And actually, the, the Rodney Alberry connection to the Johnsons is Rodney Alberry's first wife was Camille Johnson. And she unfortunately died just not long after they were married um, due to a bad patent medicine. Um, and then he remarried Myrtle um, Roberts, who was actually a friend of Camille Johnson's, and that's how they met. But when he bought the house, the Johnson house, it was when he was married to Camille Johnson. Thanks, Aaron. Okay, so let's see. I am not seeing any other questions. So we will go ahead and wrap up here for the evening, but a couple of notes before we sign off. Um, this program has been recorded and will be uploaded to our YouTube channel and we'll be sharing it through our Facebook page as well. At the conclusion of this program, you will be prompted to take a brief survey about your experience with tonight's presentation. We value your feedback and would love for you to take a moment to complete the survey. The survey will also be sent in a follow-up email in case you'd like to complete it at a later date. Thanks so much for joining us and we hope you have a great evening. Thank you.